Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with Season 1, Episode 9, Hatless. This is, um... This is a wild episode, actually. I'm not sure what to add to this one, if I'm being bold. Although, I suppose I should do this for the duration. Me previously on... First things they show off are, of course, Winona... The names. Duffy. Okay, so we know where they're going with this. Cool. So they mentioned that uh, he's on vacation. So that may or may not be relevant, but it is interesting because it highlights two specific things. Three, actually, if you're paying attention. First thing, this may or may not be the vacation that was actually mentioned much earlier in the show that he was going to be forced into making. And... <laughs> Back to that. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Unrelated. Might be the first thing that... Uh, might be that. It also might just be another vacation. I mean, it's been a bit... Unfortunately, I don't have a really good feel for the timeline here. Why not, Zero? Uh, because usually the, the, the standard approach, the standard uh, style for this kind of a thing, for TV shows in general, is that each season is usually roughly a year, right? Now, there's some fairly basic logic behind that. It's because most TV shows tend to be produced one season per year. So there's a degree of logic to that. We move forward a year, actors get older, things move, things change, yada yada. This isn't always true, but it's still a good kind of rule of thumb. So I'm going to just assume that we've got a little bit of that, you know, it's been a year thing. Oh yeah, by the way, if you're there, Jesse, uh, I've actually specifically, just, just this once... I've actually got Vent, uh, not Vent, excuse me, Discord open and looking at the off-topic page. If you want to jump in and comment on something, I can, I can share it with the group. Uh, just in case you're there. I don't know if you are, but I figured, you know, a little bit of something. Anyways, moving on. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, God. So I don't have a good feel for the timeline. But that's the first thing. The second thing that pops out to me immediately. Oh, hey, it actually did its job properly. Holy crap. Sorry, I've got a calendar bot that I'm using to keep track of streaminations on Discord. Uh, that's going to be a thing going forward, by the way. Uh, in fact, actually, sorry, I should mention this here. Let, before we talk more about the episode. So, obviously, we've actually got a new streaminations channel. It's an announcement channel. It's there to try and keep track of upcoming episodes. So, you know what the episode is. A week in advance. It'll only be doing it one week in advance, but I think one week in advance is plenty. But in the off chance you want to see what we're covering more than a week in advance on the website, if you scroll down on the left-hand column or on your phone... I believe it's the second thing. Hang on, let me let me pull up my own web page or on my own phone here. So if you pull up on the phone and at the t you know we start up at the top, go past the stream, go past the YouTube videos, go past queue list and blocks, and right there it says upcoming streaminations. It'll show the next four streaminations and the specific episodes and where we're at with that. The specific show, the specific episode. So a couple more tools for people to keep track of the streaminations since this is becoming a much more regular thing. Just thought I'd let everybody know. Good morning, Evo. Oh. <laughs> I agree with you. I, so Jesse Ward, as usual, jumping ahead in the episode here, says his favorite line from the episode. Oh, he says I can bring it up when we get there. I'll bring it up when we get there. I'll bring it up when we get there. So, vacation. So the first thing we learned about this vacation situation is that it may or may not be the one that was mentioned earlier in the show. But the second thing is that on his vacation, he's decided to go and get drunk at a bar, which doesn't sound like much of a vacation to me. But the third thing we find out as a result of that is that he was going to meet Winona. She was going to meet him there. Now, if you're paying attention, there's never really a specific reason why they were going to meet up. There's the vague intimation that it was going to be about the situation with Gary. I looked up his name, by the way. I can tell you his name now. It's freaking Gary. But that's, that's the focus. And that's interesting. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about the opening scene other than the fact that some of you may have heard me say this, and I want to say this in a very strange way. This is an excellent show, really. I highly recommend it. I have actually already recommended it to friends and to viewers, and uh, all of this stuff is working out great, and, and it's, it's awesome, and it's a great show that I just really don't like. It is a very clear example of coffee, and that opening scene is a great example of why. That's all I'm going to say on the matter, but it just it just struck me. It was just like, ooh, yeah, okay, moving on, moving on. Another thing that's interesting, 
Lord Harrimont points out, Ryland didn't think that he could actually talk to Winona sober. Anyways, real quick. Hi, Matt F. Which I'm probably saying incredibly wrong. Um, should I say Matt F? It's probably Matt F. Like, like that, that feels logical for the screen name. But hi. Welcome to the Stream of Nations. We're covering Justified for today and for, I believe, the next five weeks. Something like that. Uh, after that, we'll be covering Arcane, and I don't remember what's after Arcane, but th this is this is a regular thing. Every every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. EST, we go ahead and cover a show. This is essentially what's what's replacing the Star Trek Ruminations is this kind of live format. So. Eh, we'll see, Lord Harriman. I should probably mention that I can't wait to stop covering this show. And uh, this we're just covering one season here as opposed to Avatar, which we're going to have to cover a whole lot more. So not quite the same situation. Don't want to get your hopes up. Moving on. So then they start the fight, and of course the gunslinger, who is not a brawler, who is also drunk, loses the fight. Yeah, okay, that tracks. Now, I've never actually commented on this before, but there's this damn motel they keep going to. The reason I never commented on it before is it just sort of made a degree of vague sense that Raylan and uh, Ava, who is usually the one showing up there, would just be meeting up at this one motel, and if I might be so bold, it makes sense from a set perspective. You've got that one set, it's tight, it's enclosed, it's easy to light, it's relatively cheap to set up, we're good, right? So, cool. But this is the first episode where it's really been hammered in, and I, I feel the need to actually comment. Oh, okay, so we're not going to do that one. Sorry. We're still, we're still working out the new playlist here. Um... But this is the first episode where it's made very clear that this is a situation where Raylan does not have any kind of permanent housing. He is literally being shacked up at a motel. And all of a sudden, all his surliness makes more sense. You ever sit at a motel for a decent period of time, like, say, a week? Because that sucks. <laughs> motel beds and having to deal with all that crap and there's just this scent that slowly builds up because of the nature of how those are very contained and they don't actually have proper insulation or not sorry insulate not airflow they don't have proper airflow that's not fun that's not cool but either way <clears throat> so we once again and yeah as, as jesse ward points out it makes perfect sense that he wants to get out of kentucky as soon as possible so why would he actually get you know an apartment or anything like that I was actually thinking about that, Mr. Red. We could do that as a test run for Avatar. You know, maybe fund the first season of Avatar, see how it goes. Is Justified a good show? Well, apparently, uh, you weren't listening to me about a minute ago, so I will repeat myself. Uh, or maybe Twitch is being weird, because Twitch does tend to be weird. Justified is a very good show that I happen to not like, but it is nevertheless an excellent show that I highly recommend to everyone, including everybody currently listening to this. So... <clears throat> We continue to have some excellent chemistry between Winona and uh, Raylan. I'm not going to repeat myself too much here. I have more to talk about later in specifics, but I did want to point out a couple of individual specific things. First of all, Winona is clearly upset at Raylan and trying to be antagonistic towards him, but cannot help but not only be very physically comfortable with him, which it, what I mean by that is the actress and the actor... Um, they show a great deal of physical familiarity. I mean, that makes sense. They were married for six years. But my point is, most actors don't do that. Uh, there's a degree of body language in acting that a lot of people tend to, to just kind of dismiss that also needs to be present in this kind of situation. And it's clear that she has no problem with any of this. He has no problem taking his shirt off and laying down and being injured and in a vulnerable state. And she has no problem going right up and just assuming this is what needs to happen. Pulling his boots off and cleaning up his wounds and sitting right next to him while he's chatting. Again, very uh, immediate intimacy without actually being romantic. Very well, Jobs. But on top of that, you'll notice she cannot help herself but by being open with him. Not just honest, but open. Volunteering information unprompted. And this is what kind of gets the whole episode going, really. Is she just flat out, you know, is like, look, you know, here's the situation. This is what's going on with it. Duffy showed up at my place. Holy crap. Um, <clears throat> tons of stuff like that. He is also... Uh, he focuses like he's just got this uh probably because he's not only in a lot of pain but he's drunk so he's he's just been beaten up and he's drunk and yet there's a couple of moments where he very clearly hones in and focuses 
And uh, the two big ones are, of course, when talking about Duffy breaking in and mentioning his intuition, you know, and defending himself as to why he decided to go after Gary and just be like, hey, we're friends, no hardship, I ain't gonna shoot you. But if you do anything bad, I'm gonna kill you. His explanation of that, his defense of that is very simple. It sounds a lot like something a husband would say. You have almost never been wrong. When you say something's wrong, I tend to believe you that something's wrong. And, that, and she just kind of tries to brush that off. Meanwhile, then we cut over to Gary going to visit Toby. Can I just say I really like Toby in this episode, like a lot. They, 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 got, they, they continue to get really good guest stars. Just like over in Star Trek, good guest stars tend to continue to elevate the episodes a lot. It's, it's awesome. So he also gets across a lot very quickly and very efficiently without actually having to uh, do so. See, why is this one on the list? Sorry, we're still, we're still making the list here. We're still making the list. Um, Going to have to put my wife in pads and tackle her. Um, talks about the worst day of his life with his ring and calls out Gary on his BS immediately. In all three situations, he is immediately established, the kind of person he is and a little bit of his history and his backstory and why he's here and all that fun stuff. Toby's awesome. And the best part, and I, this, this is a very small amount of characterization, but I love it. There's this wonderful bit where he gets across that Despite the fact that he made tons of money playing football and has a nice house with a wife and loving kids and all that, despite all of this positive in his mind, you can tell he still regrets not actually being able to play because of his because of his knee injury. And that just says just a little bit of extra something about the kind of person he is. This then immediately ties into how he reacts to Gary. He's like, all right, Gary. You're in over your head. You've done something stupid. And he just calls him on it like that. Because the whole thing, and I don't want to sound dismissive towards Gary's actor either. The whole time, Gary acts like someone who is... Like his feet are on fire, right? There's just this kind of fearful energy. Like he's just barely holding on to a degree of normalcy while he's freaking out, right? That's the overall vibe he's getting across. So he's like, alright, look, Gary, tell me the truth. Don't try to sell me on this stupid thing. I got a mortgage. What's really going on? And he's like, oh my God, I'm in debt. Um, uh, I think... <laughs> well, congratulations, Jesse. You made it. Uh, no, this this is actually Nier Automata. That is, well, actually, it's a remix of Nier Automata. Uh, this is something I'm experimenting with. I'm kind of building a new playlist for these streaminations because... Well, Morrowind music is nice. There's like eight songs in Morrowind, and I want to have a little bit of variety of these streaminations, especially since this is supposed to be kind of a long-term thing. So that's that's why I'm kind of deleting songs and rebuilding them as I go here, because I haven't had a lot of time to sit down and design this list yet. Moving on. So Gary is in way over his head, obviously. And yet, debt is a terrifying thing, speaking of someone who is not in debt. Um, debt's a terrifying thing. And Toby, being a bro, is just like, you know what, you want me to go over? I'll push back. And you notice his overall approach is, I'm not going to make this problem go away for you. But what I am going to do is I'm going to go push back and we're going to try to make the situation so you get more time so you can eventually pay this guy back. Okay, no, that makes a bit of sense. That makes a bit of sense. I'm with it. All right. So then they go to see Duffy. Immediate contrast. I love how they go straight from Gary who tries to scam someone who he's obviously friends enough with to go visit and to be on a first-name basis with the wife and kids, and then cuts straight to Duffy, who is the exact opposite of that. <laughs> just, just a completely different type of person. Duffy is co completely in control of the situation, completely on top of things. Raylan comes in, Duffy's like, oh yeah, okay, and plays very straight. He tries the smiley affable thing, and then it goes away within seconds. And when Raylan does his final thing, and Raylan, you'll notice, is continuing his trend of being very honest with him. It's like, look, I never want to see you people again. I never want to do this deal again. You do anything to the wife, I'll come kill you. Okay, cool. Bye. Peace. And Duffy's first reaction is find out how he connected to us, find out where he came from, and then put him in the ground. Now, that sounds horrible, and of course, in, in many ways it is, but part of the point here 
is that she, uh, she, wow, he is completely on top of this situation, takes Raylan seriously as a threat, and knows Raylan has to be dealt with immediately. No hesitation, no fallback, no nothing. Go kill him. Someone just showed up threatening me. Go kill him. And that establishes the level of competency of Duffy. I would actually go so far as to say, and I actually mentioned this earlier too, first time Duffy showed up, that Duffy is the highest level character we've seen so far on the criminal side of things. Um, yeah, no kidding, Lord Harriman's like, what? <laughs> of course, they don't show that. We do see him talk to Arnett, who Arnett, of course, is not taking the situation seriously at all. Now, this is a bit crude, and I'm not a big fan of that, but it does establish Arnett as a character almost immediately. Duffy's like, I've just been threatened by a U.S. Marshal. I'm, I'm going to be dealing with them. The, what do you want me to do about the Gary situation? And Arnett is busy getting a blowjob from his secretary in the office. And barely paying attention. And Duffy is like, what are you doing? You know what? I'll call you back. <laughs> I'll, let's... Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. So... Then Gary and Toby come over to try and muscle. And this is... Oh God, I love this episode. This is an immediate contrast. Raylan comes in. Duffy is a, immediately stonewalls. Duffy recognizes an at-level threat. I, I know I keep using you know the, the video game or the D&D uh, comparison, but I think it continues to fit. Gary and Toby shows up, and Duffy's like focusing most of attention on Toby because he doesn't think Gary's... Like he, he doesn't give a damn about Gary. He has absolutely no respect for Gary whatsoever. So he keeps like barely paying attention to Gary. Gary keeps looking at Toby. I feel like I know you. I feel like I feel like you're. I think. I think you're something. Hang on, hang on. And then he goes over and he talks to Toby and says, "I'm going to give you a chance to walk away from this." There's a weird amount of respect in that. Like, he clearly recognizes, all right, you're the one who I'm actually, who I'm, who's actually worth talking to in this particular enta entanglement. So, I don't really got a beef with you. Go away. Just go away. Toby, of course, comes down on, you know, he's like, no, I'm not doing that. It's like, okay, cool, cool. Then Gary completely screws up everything. And the episode makes it very clear that everyone knows that Gary just screwed up everything. Listen, I can have your money tomorrow, or if you wait two years, I could double your money. And it's just like, Gary, Gary, you're trying, no, dude. <laughs> Gary is so pathetic. It's actually really kind of sad. This is about when I mentioned, I mentioned in my notes, that it feels like uh, Duffy is established not only as the competent underling, but a middle tier, middle tier executor. Or executor, actually, excuse me, is more accurate. Uh, some, although executor certainly fits for Duffy. But he's the kind of person who isn't actually the... Uh, the kingpin. He's not the one who's loaning up the money. He's not the one who's dealing with the situation. He's just here to clean up when things go badly. The kind of person that is effectively the, 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 the inverse of Raylan, the U.S. Marshal. We'll see where they go with that, or if they go anywhere with that, because I don't know. Um, I will. I will. I already mentioned that Duffy was mentioned as a major character, so we'll see if he even shows up again in season one. Because I actually thought they were going to kill him in, in the shootout scene, but we'll get back to that in a minute. So, all of that fails. Raylan goes to see Pitner, which, can I just say, I was actually legitimately happy to see Pitner again. Like, there was something enjoyable about that. Anyway, so we see Pitner again, and as usual, Pitner is the fixer, and he is still a good fixer, just like he was in his previous episode. He's got the information, he knows exactly where it's going from, he's still a little bit of a slime ball, but he's still very straight, and is like, alright, here's the information, boom, boom, boom. Also, apparently Tahiti isn't that great, who knew? Go figure. Either way, <laughs> either way... <clears throat> He gets the information we find out a little bit of establishment about Duffy and Arnett. Arnett is a pretty normal scamster. This is the kind of thing that unfortunately happens all the freaking time in real life. Um, 
no questions asked, high interest cash loans. Let me give you a little bit of what I'm going to call the duh advice, okay? If anybody, if you ever are in desperate need of money, don't take a high interest cash, no questions asked loan. Not because you'll end up with people like Arnett or even Duffy, but because they're always scams and they're never worth it. Like, I, I will drive by on the highway and I'll see freaking billboard ads for these kind of loans. Don't. Don't take those loans. <laughs> I'm not joking. <clears throat> so that's Arnett. Okay. Low-tier scammer. That, that, that co coincides with what we said earlier. He doesn't take any of this seriously. He's not actually a criminal in the, is in, in the strictest sense of the word. He is a lawbreaker, uh, just like, uh, just like Gary is. But then he starts talking about Duffy and Billy Mac. And the specific story they give is that he, they, they found a guy's brother, cut off the brother's face, and sewed it to a soccer ball. Now that establishes three things very clearly. First of all, the thing we've already been talking about, that Duffy is the actual high-level criminal here. Two, that they are psychopaths which Billy Mac certainly ex accentuates. And three, and this is the interesting one, they are more than willing to go after the persons adjacent to their target, a.k.a. the so-called weak points in the psychological makeup. So that's messed up. A criminal is someone like Duffy who will cut off someone's face. A lawbreaker is someone like Gary who will take a shady loan and then try to do some questionable things in order to clear it. Don't listen to Trihexia. The, the difference is what I just mentioned. A lawbreaker is someone who breaks the law. A criminal is someone who has a very distinct mindset. Now, I know you haven't been watching these Striminations, Evo, but it's something that keeps coming up in the show, that we keep seeing some characters who are lawbreakers and then some characters who are criminals. And the criminals are always the really dangerous ones because they're the ones who are usually willing to do the really horrible things without really being bothered by doing so. Anyways. <clears throat> so... Why does nobody lock their doors in this show? Is that... Is that just me who's bothered by that? Granted, I always lock my doors in all situations just because of literal habit. But nobody locks their doors in this show. Duffy is, is like three separate times able to just walk into something. Because they have absolutely no problems walking in there. There's, there's nothing preventing them from doing so. It is a thing in a lot of shows. It's very strange. Anyways, whatever. So, <clears throat> Duffy actually specifically calls out Toby for not locking his doors. And Duffy, I want to mention, shows up with a gun in hand, ready to go. Now, you notice he doesn't use it, because that's he doesn't need to. He is not actually here to kill him. The gun is there to make a message. You notice as soon as he's made his message clear, he's made exactly what's going to happen clear, he walks over, puts the gun down, and grabs a glass to get some water or something. Whatever he was drinking, I don't actually pay attention. Billy Mac, of course, taunts him. Now, Billy Mac, for all we're seeing, is a crude and unpleasant, horrible human being. But he does something surprisingly smart here. He taunts Toby, forcing Toby to start the fight on Billy Mac's terms. Billy Mac, of course, then sees the the initial swing coming. I'm pretty sure that if Toby had su successfully connected with that attack with a frying pan, Billy Mac would have been out. But he didn't, because he telegraphed it way too hard. So then Billy Mac uh, beats the ever-loving crap out of him, which is honestly a really unpleasant scene to watch. Then they go after Gary stomp on him so to speak you notice they go uh much less much less hard to gary don't show up with the gun in hand don't show up at his his house invading his kitchen and they don't have to pull a trick in order to get him because gary is so much lower level they don't need to with gary they just go after gary and it's like hey buddy whap so here's the situation get us our money 9 a.m or else whap and they're done that's it then they give him the ring back to make sure to just to showcase where they're at with this. Cute, lovely people. Criminals. So. Then, finally, for the first time in the episode, we see Raylan be competent. I don't mean to sound negative, but most of the episode's actually been focusing on the guest stars. Raylan's actually kind of the guest star of this episode, which works, if I might be so bold. Because Raylan 
is waiting for Billy Mac, grabs his gun, has a gun now, and it's like, all right, so now that I have a gun, the shooter, the gunslinger, is in his element. And he says, all right, Billy Mac, you're going to give me some information on how this is going to work. Billy Mac is, of course, a crude, violent, psychopathic idiot. Bang, bang, give me the info. Okay, fine. We're going to kidnap the wife in order to push on to him. Raylan's like, okay. Dismantles the gun, takes the clip, so he has no ammo. I'll, uh, uh, okay. This is screwed up. So he calls Winona and says, Winona, you need to get out, get the gun and get out. She says, oh, I can't. Gary has the gun. First of all, that's probably the most unbelievable thing in this entire show. The two people who live in Kentucky own one handgun between them. I call bull on that. But second of all, she stonewalls. You're going to tell me what's going on or whatever. Notice Raylan refuses to. This is important because later in the episode, actually two scenes from now, you'll notice that Raylan tells her what's going on instantly as the first thing he says to her in like two sentences. So why didn't he tell her on the phone? Because it was on the phone. Like a proper marshal, he is quite aware of the fact that everything they're saying is something that can and will be tapped and or traced and or recorded. Those kind of things can be pulled. A uh, simple, uh, oh God, what's it called? Uh, subpoena or petition could get that information quickly and easily. So he doesn't tell any of that on the phone. Interesting. Yeah, the gun thing is good foreshadowing, I agree. But then we cut to Gary. And a scene which I think might actually be my favorite scene in the episode. Maybe my second favorite. So, he goes... Gary goes to see Toby. Toby's wife says, You've got some nerve coming here. Get the hell out of here. Toby says, It's okay. It comes out on crutches. Now, thankfully, Toby is rich and therefore can financially you know, take care of the situation. But obviously, whatever happened with his knee is probably no good. And he's probably no longer able to, you know, go play with his daughters, which is something he specifically mentioned earlier as being thankful that his knee was good enough to do. He's obviously pretty messed up about this. But an interesting dynamic occurs between these two immediately. Gary is freaked out. What's he saying? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just over and over. I'm so sorry. I cannot believe this. Oh my god. I'm so sorry. What's the first question he asks Toby? Are the girls okay? Make sure to give the ring back. Toby is obviously not happy about any of this and not particularly fond of Gary. Probably never wants to see Gary ever again. And he probably never will. And yet, at the same time, there's not really a malice there. Not really the true antagonizement. It's just, we're done. And he gets that across brilliantly. Again, credit to the action. He gets across brilliantly. We're done. Thank you for the ring. And Gary, meanwhile, is having a complete mental breakdown at the consequences of his actions. He, in his foolishness and his desperation, has completely screwed up this situation. And he knows it. And now he's spiraling harder because his attempts in desperation to improve the situation have made things worse. Because Gary, the lawbreaker, is a moron. So then we see the other really, really great scene in the episode. It's the scene between Raylan and Winona, again. The dynamic between, I already mentioned, you know, what's going on? You tell me what's going on right now. And he says, immediately, first reaction, yes, ma'am. Here's the problem. Here's the Dixie Mafia. They run out of this place. He just he just gives her all the information right up front. She's like, oh my god, I can't believe this is happening. And Raylan is clearly focused on her. And obviously cares more about her than Gary. Duh. And he doesn't try to hide that. But he does mention, I am going to try and make sure to get Gary back. I'm going to try and ensure that he lives through this situation. That tracks... But what I find really awesome about this scene is the body language. Whoever directed the scene and or the actors themselves knew what they were doing. Let me point out two very specific things that happen. So when she realizes the full depth of how bad this thing is, she very naturally and fluidly moves forward and just thumps her head on his chest. Now, that may sound like a small thing, 
But that kind of maneuver implies and states outright a huge amount of personal comfort with someone. You don't do that to a stranger. You probably don't even do that to a friend. You do that to someone you know very well, like a loved one or family member or someone who is in a comma, someone who you're very, very close to. That's the kind of thing that implies a lot. But while she's doing that, his hands go out like this. Like, so she's coming in here. His hands go out like this. Don't touch her. Don't actually touch her. And God, I love Timmy, Timothy Oliver. He does this thing where you can tell he's not sure what to do with his hands. Because it's obvious his first instinct is to immediately pull her in to comfort her. But wait, this isn't my wife anymore. And you can just see that. You can just see that as, as his hands are like... And, and he finally goes to reach out to actually... You know, hold her shoulders in, 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 in a in a like a, a compromise of comfort. That's when she pulls back, and he immediately his hands like burst right off her, like like he's touched something hot. Like, ah, uh, uh, yep, yep. And then it's like, okay, we need to go find him, but I'm not going to leave you here. You need to come with me. Okay. Then then he reaches out a hand, as like you know you know basically come on, let's go. She actually goes out of way to move around the hand. And then bypass, at which point he's left there, and there's just a moment of... And it's literally just a moment. It's less than a second before he's like, okay, well, let's go. And it's wonderful body language. So much is being told without the actor saying a damn thing, and I love it. Great scene. And as usual, the two actors act off of each other brilliantly. So then as they're driving, that's when they start to get into the married couple argument. Um... The two actors do a really good job of acting like they, they've known each other for years and they know each other very well. That's harder to pull off than you'd think. Because realistically speaking, the actress who plays Winona and Timothy Oliphant probably don't know each other at all. They probably met, like, in, in real life terms, maybe a month ago. So actually having to demonstrate that level of, of understanding and comfort with her, that, that's harder to do than it sounds. And uh, definitely praise to both of them, but also praise to the writer, who actually does some very excellent dialogue for this particular sequence. But what it boils down to is she talks about how she, she... She doesn't actually say this outright. But as they talk around each other, you can tell that the problem, the thing that made her finally leave uh, Raylan, was that Raylan was negative. His overall aura, his mentality, which tracks... He's been kind of gruff and kind of, ugh, you know, the typical Old West, ah, I'm too old for this kind of attitude, right? That's been his shtick the entire time, and she got sick of it, and that makes sense. Having to deal with that level of negativity is very logical. Uh, that is to say, having to live, deal with that level of negativity for that long a time bothering you is very logical. Thing is, if she didn't want that, she probably shouldn't have married a lawman. As we've actually talked about on this show last week, some jobs just kind of grind people down. Remember I was talking about what it's like to be a guard? A prison guard or a jail guard? You know, this whole cycle of bullcrap that, that was a major theme of the last episode? Yeah, if, if she wanted that kind of optimism and positivity in her life, this is not the direction to get it from. Still... It is interesting how much she has, yeah, no kidding, Eva, how much she is willing to be open about this. She talks about how she wants ambition in her life, positivity in her life, optimism in her life, someone who is hoping for a better tomorrow. And I want to, I, I mentioned that because it's this little nugget I want you to just remember for a bit, okay? So then, you know, Raylan goes to meet Gary. You know, where would he be if he isn't going straight to Duffy? We don't actually hear the answer to that. We don't need to because, you know, okay, then they go to the ball thing. And who's there? It's it's Raylan. Put the gun away. Where's your hat? Did they beat you up too? No, no. God, dude. And what I really love about this scene, probably in Pearl Star Destroyer, what I really love about this scene is everything. But <laughs> I'll kill myself. Who are you going to shoot? There's There's one other person out here. You idiot! Raylan gets so pissed about it for all the right reasons. That's not going to solve anything. You kill yourself, she doesn't get the money, so she'll actually be in a worse situation. Ah, oh, crap, you're right. <laughs> because Raylan, for all his pessimism, is certainly someone who tends to think things through, which is, which is why the Ava thing makes even less sense, and I'm going to continue complaining about that. 
I feel like the showmakers have noticed that too, because you notice Ava has just kind of left the narrative for a while, right? Yeah, if he if he killed himself, the debt would almost assuredly fall to Winona. Legally, even ignoring the fact that surely people like Duffy would go after Winona. So that's just gonna make everything worse. And then he starts getting, oh god, it's it's gonna make everything worse. I don't understand. And then Raylan. Raylan walks up and he does what he's best at. He's very honest, very straightforward. And he connects with him. He connects with Gary. So he says, Gary, come on, before, and this is the line, pitch it to me before one of us shoots you. So he pitches the thing. And credit to Gary's actor. Gary's actor's been doing a good job in general, but this is where he really shines. Because here you can see the metaphorical sparks in his eyes as he talks about this great project. And you can tell that Gary wasn't in this for the money. He was not trying to get up in the world. He was not trying to, you know, remaneuver himself or... I don't, it wasn't doing, being done out of greed. It wasn't being done out of anything. It was just being done because what he really wanted was to make this awesome thing happen. Yeah, exactly. That's that nugget I've asked you to remember. Because Raylan says, all right, what he's, what he's really saying, he doesn't say it out loud, but he's really, what he's really saying is, show me why my wife married you. And Gary is just talking, he's like, what about during winter? That's the best part. And you can just see the 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 optimism, the eye. It's oh god, it's gonna be wonderful. And that's when Raylan's like, "All right, I'm impressed." And he's honest, but it ain't worth dying for. I'll go with you. And I get the very strong feeling that Raylan decided right then and there, after seeing what Winona saw in him, that's when he decided, all right, I'll back you. Now, this is important, because Gary was going to lose this situation. You notice we haven't had a duel yet. So then we see Arnett, and Arnett's goon. I don't think they even named the guy. And then we see Duffy, and Billy Mac, and, and then, you know, Raylan and uh, Gary show up. Pretty tight scene. Uh, believe it or not, it's harder than you'd think to film a scene with this many actors in a relatively small set. It's actually very frustrating to set up lighting and cameras and cabling for such a thing. So, credit where credit is due. Yeah, Billy Mac never found the cat. It's weird. This is the duel. But it's a really fascinating duel. So, Gary gives up. Gives up his dream. And the implication here is that the whole reason he's been doing all these things out of desperation is because he didn't want to give up on his dream. And I understand that completely. Personally, even. So he refused to give up on his dream. And that's why he'd been trying to look into money. And that's why he had had talked to Toby. And that's why he was doing all this thing. Fine, I give up. Here's the freaking land. You win. Arnett is, of course, satisfied with this. Why wouldn't he be? Arnett is not only a small-time lawbreaker, but has probably realized that getting into legitimate real estate is an actually beneficial project. Duffy is none of those things. Within seconds, rewatch this scene sometime, seriously. Within seconds, Raylan susses out, okay, the reason I call this the duel is specifically because this is a duel between three different entities, which we haven't really seen before. Most of the duels, as you might imagine based on the title, have been between two people or two groups. Now we've got three groups. And Raylan is brilliant in this scene because he only says like three lines total but each of them are scalpel precise every single one of them is specifically designed to instigate the fight that happens not and in a way that leaves him and gary completely out of it he is trying to turn arnett and duffy against each other just make that happen oh yeah this is probably what arnett wanted the whole time and arnett doesn't d deny that too he just looks at him like huh Duffy initially pulls out his gun. What does he pull it pointed at? The greatest threat in the room, Raylan. It is not until the duel progresses and the continued push uh, between uh, Arnett's team and Duffy's team goes that Duffy finally readdresses his gun over there. The moment, oh, hang on, bot. Uh, God, they keep moving the ban button on me. There we go. Boop. <laughs> Stop doing that, Twitch. 
The moment that Duffy redirects the gun towards Arnett, Raylan has won the duel as of that second. And you'll notice that the actual gunshots get fired very shortly thereafter. Raylan pushes Gary back. Notice he does that, by the way. He's like cover, trying to cover him. Gary's, you know, hiding in the corner, essentially. Gary gets furious and goes after Duffy. Not Arnett. Duffy. And Raylan, of course, you know, takes control of the situation. Gets his gun. Is like, alright, look, this is how this is going. I'm gonna need some cop cars and an ambulance. I love this duel. It's not my favorite duel. But there's better duels, but this is a... This is a very, very well done duel between the three of them. And uh, I'm I'm almost glad we're going to see more of Duffy at some point in the future. And by we, I mean probably you, because I doubt he's going to be in the rest of season one. How screwed is Duffy for going after Arnett? It's a good question. But Arnett, Arnett's just a lone person. He's barely on the criminal side of things. If anything, Arnett is probably screwed. This is my prediction. And I don't want to hear if I'm right or wrong. I imagine that Arnett is more screwed here for having gone after Duffy than vice versa. And then we, of course, see the last little tidbit where, you know, he, he takes his his uh, ex-wife's husband to his ex-wife. Pretty much a one-to-one a -one classic scene. As I've said many times, tropes aren't necessarily bad. She looks at him. Thank you. Thank you. He gets a call from Joe. He goes to get his hat. And he's like, all right, look, here's the money thing. Cool. You know, playing it peaceful. I'm not, I'm not drunk this time. All I want is the hat back. It doesn't even fit you. And it took a minute for him to really process. And you can tell that the two goons are both thinking it through. And it takes him a minute to be like, all right, this isn't worth it. And Raylan gets his hat back. I happen to love the uh, the obvious metaphor here. Because he spends the entire episode without his hat. And he's also not on duty. He's taking a week vacation. So he's not acting as a U.S. Marshal in this entire episode. He is just acting as Raylan. So now we got to rate this episode. Ugh. Well, the first thing you do, Matt is you ask me, so make sure you have your whispers turned on. Because if you don't have your whispers turned on, well, then we're going to have some problems. And then I send you a link in a private whisper. You're going to have to give me a second, though. No, 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 no. Without future knowledge, because Arnett, who is a lawbreaker, just went after, uh, I don't know, Matt, if you didn't get the whisper just now, I, I actually can't help you. I know that sounds terrible. I'm usually not the one who does the invite, so I'm kind of guessing on this one. Uh, anyways, why do I think Arnett's in trouble? I feel like I've already answered that question. Arnett's a nobody. Arnett is barely one step above Gary. The only reason Arnett is better than Gary is because Arnett has money and Gary does not. Otherwise, both of them are at the exact same tier. All Arnett is is someone who has money to then loan out to people and then hire other people to go get his money for him because Arnett can't get that money himself. Duffy sewed off a guy's face or cut off a guy's face and sewed it to a soccer ball. Hate to keep going back to that. Anyways, so, let's rate this episode. Now, you mentioned purple. What's the extra oomph for you, Mr. Red? Because there always has to be that extra oomph for something to push up to purple or something down to black. I guess I'll just pull up my own list. It's just the easiest way to do this. Use my own commands. Yeah, about a month left, looks like. In fact, I think that'll be... Hang on. One, two... Yep, looks like April 1st, 
would be our would be our first extermination act. I might not do a extermination on April first. That sounds like a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> um. A joke stream-ination. What do I do a joke stream-ination on? I agree with him going to help the man who stole his wife says a lot about Raylan. Ironically, even though Raylan is a, essentially a guest character in this show, or this episode, excuse me, he's he gets a lot of characterization in this one. I'm seeing a lot of votes for purple here. See, that probably shouldn't be here. There we go. That's a good one. No, that would be a terrible idea. That would also be mean. I don't like doing mean April Fools. If you've been paying attention, every April Fools I've done has, has followed a theme. And that theme is something I do actually intend to do someday. You... You should just be able to... Are you on a phone or on the browser, Matt F? Because I don't need to send you another whisper. You've you've got a whisper. It's there. It's logged. That, in fact, that link is good for seven days. You're on the phone. All right, hang on. That's actually a bit trickier, but give me a second. Give me a second. So, if you... Why is this on the front of my phone? Bikini squats! Go away! God almighty. All right, so let's assume you're, you're watching me right now. It's easy to, too easy to assume because you're currently doing that. There we go. So we go to me. So we got the chat. Okay, so how do I pull up whispers from here? Can you seriously not pull up whispers from here? You cannot. All right, here's what I want you to do. Uh, you need to... Go to, basically just close my channel, right, Medev? Uh, obviously, don't wait until I'm done. Go back to, like, the main page, like, when you first pull up Twitch. And it'll be, like, you know, your your icon in the upper left. And then there's, like, a little chest-looking thing. And then there's a little chat bubble-looking thing. Click that chat bubble-looking thing right there. That'll pull up your whispers. I can actually see my whisper to you right there. And it'll be at the very top. It'll be a link from me. You, know, you click that, and that will actually give you the invite. I mean, it's been a bit of a saga so far, Lord Harrimont. Probably Jalex Brown. I, what's the? Do I need? Do I need to do squats? Here, I'll, I'll get up. I'll get. I'll do some squats. Hang on, hang on. I'm not in a bikini though, so you know, just. Is this doing anything for anybody? It's hard for me to rate this episode purple, because I actively dislike it. But I think that's just the show in general. So if I'm to divorce myself from my opinion, which is something I can do, I could see this as being a purple. So we're going to go and rate it as purple. That's three purples in season one. That's ridiculous. If you ever needed me, if you ever needed me, the um for me is actually the scenes between uh, Raylan and Winnell, especially the, the second one specifically. Um... Hey, looks like you got the link. Um, because it's just, it's extremely well done, and it speaks so much to the, 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 the opinion and preference of the two characters. Yeah, that's ridiculous. For those of you not aware, that is an insanely good... Didn't we already play this song? Oh, we did. That's why. It's an insanely good ratio. That speaks a huge amount to the quality of this show. It's bonkers. <laughs> I don't know how the rest of the seasons would go, exactly. Well, that's actually not true. Um, you haven't seen it yet, but I've reviewed TOS, Enterprise, um, and MLP, of the three shows I've actually reviewed. Now, obviously MLP actually is the best of those three, go figure. But, um, the, the point I'm trying to reach here is that even MLP didn't exactly start strong. 
MLP did manage that. Yeah, MLP actually had some really good purple ratio. It's kind of crazy. Uh, I didn't review TAS. You'll notice when the... God, when is that going live? When is that going live? Hang on, let me pull up my schedule here. So the TOS finale... Hang on a second. Sorry, it's taking a minute. Yeah, I saw it, Medef. Sorry, I guess you didn't hear me comment on that. Because you were off doing that. Um... The US finale is going to go live on March 20th, it looks like. About four weeks from now. A little over four weeks from now. Then you'll see how uh, TOS actually reviewed. The day after that, you'll see how Enterprise reviewed. And then I've got one last little special thing for having covered track. That'll go live uh, that particular Wednesday. <sighs> it's weird to think we're that close to it at this point. I mean, I'm done. I've already covered Trek. I'm, I'm good from my perspective. I finished covering Trek two years ago. <laughs> but it's still weird to think about. It's finally going live. I hope to redo Voyager. Actually, so... For those of you not aware, Streaminations have taken over the category. That's that's how we do shows now on from now on. That's why there's no more Ruminations. They've been replaced. So, like, these, these VODs for Justified will start going live on Mondays on uh, whatever's after March 20th which would be, looks like March 27th. And that's this is going to be what's going to take up that slot. But if we look at the list here and pull up the Streamination's page, pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure Voyager is here. Yep, right there. And it's something that I'll probably put some dealer's choice towards because I'd love to actually cover Voyager properly, but also review Voyager because we never even reviewed Voyager. At the moment, however... The next couple shows, I'll go ahead and tell you, for those of you who don't pay attention to the website, you know who you are. So, we're finishing Justified, obviously. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do Arcane next. After that, we're doing a very long show that'll take us, I think, about six months to go through. That's called Tangled. Then we're going to do The Mandalorian, Seasons 1 and 2, specifically. And then Clone Wars Season 7. All of that is already paid for and, and on the books. Uh, after that, the next... The next most likely show is probably going to be Andor, which is fairly well funded, and then Book of Boba Fett, Bad Batch, and a couple of other things. So we'll see how that lines up when we get there. But either way, obviously there'll be no streams for the rest of the day, because I'm going to be doing rewrite work, and there'll be no streams tomorrow, because I'll be hanging out with my family. So Monday, I hope to see you guys for more Subnautica Below Zero, where I'll be starting the stream with a little bit of a rant and an explanation for some negatives. <laughs> <laughs>